And now um, we can open it up for some questions. We have a couple of good questions in here already. We've had a couple of questions on climate change. Do So a couple of folks have talked about this 1.2 times bank full width, which is where we, we really want the streams to be spanned. We want to add that extra 20% um, of width inside the crossing so that we're, we're ready for those big storms. Is that going to be enough with climate change happening? We saw those numbers that they're, you know, 23% bigger, these annual storms. Um, is that going to be enough to address climate change? Mm, that's a really good question. And it's really hard to say because when we do the kind of study, hydro hydrologic study, about how much water comes down from a watershed to its, to its stream crossing, like uh, the ones we just built on the stream table, uh, we're always kind of playing catch up because what do we, we, we don't usually project precipitation into the future very well. We're looking at what precipitation has happened in recent years, uh, and then we can estimate how much water should be coming to our crossing. What we've been using in a stream smart approach is trying to build in a, a really fundamental uh, conservatism, essentially, in those design um, plans in our systems. And so one of the things we plan to do and is built into some of the permitting is that we always want to leave 20% vertical space uh, also free for passing debris, for ensuring that our estimate of the, let's say, the 100-year flood event uh, is really not going to be exceeded. And so we're trying to build in a sort of a buffer in our design plans. But the fact is, uh, it's hard to say whether we're truly working far enough ahead in that sort of conservatism in those design plans. The good news is, I'll put it this way, if you heard me say in the video that a lot of our culverts in the state of Maine were designed essentially, if they were designed at all, and most of them were not, thinking maybe about passing a 10-year flow, a relatively small storm. Some of them you see even in the current state standards are really meant to pass about a 25-year storm event. And in StreamSmart, we're really uh, trying to address what we think now is the 100-year flow with additional space. So we think we're doing a pretty good job if we can make progress with StreamSmart crossings across Maine uh, for a lot of these crossings that were designed for 10-year crossings to this current standard of more like a 100-year crossing, that we will do very well at being much more resilient in our road network with our stream crossings well into the future. Thanks, Alex. We had a lot of climate change questions, so that is that's great. Um, here's a kind of specific uh, question, but we we do get this uh, um, off and on. How do we design for a situation where it's an outlet of a pond, and you have those those fluctuations of the of the water um, throughout the season, throughout the year? Um, how do you you know? Um, and, and, and this can be a man-made impoundment. It can also be a natural impoundment. Um, so do you want to touch on that one a little bit? Sure, that's wading into some interesting waters. And I think the key is the point you just made, Sarah. And that is uh, because most folks don't necessarily realize that almost every pond or lake in the state of Maine is enhanced, shall we say, <laughs> uh, if not necessarily by a dam, a real dam, by piles of rubble that were put there um, to enlarge the lake or maintain a higher lake level. And of course, so many people live in Maine on lakes and enjoy them, and so many people come to Maine for its beautiful lakes, and that's fantastic. But when you're a fish, trying to get to a lake to spawn, think about the alewives, the millions of alewives that we've got in Maine and more and more coming all the time, thanks to a lot of work folks are doing. Um, they still need to pass whatever kind of obstructions are there. And so it's certainly a question to have about what the appropriate lake level is and then what the appropriate outlet of that lake should look like. It's a relatively simple thing to have a pretty natural um, rock uh, feature that can be built right into a stream crossing that's designed to stream smart standards or upstream of that crossing uh, or conceivably downstream. There are all sorts of logistical issues to be wrestled with, but really that question about how to uh, manage lake levels is separate from stream smart. We can definitely address all those needs, but getting back to a point Mary was making earlier, if it comes to designing a tech, what we call a technical fishway with baffles and weirs and things, that is not stream smart. That inevitably leaves some elements of stream smart out. It doesn't really pass the kind of ecological 
elements that we want, and it doesn't pass even all fish, let alone uh, often things like macroinvertebrates and other elements of the system that we are addressing with StreamSmart. Uh, inevitably, those things are somewhat halfway measures, even as expensive as they can be. Thanks, Alex. That's a great answer to a tough question. Um, and I know that there, there have been um, some stream smart crossings put in that have included those baffles and step pools, and it requires so much more engineering um, and such uh, so much, um, well, a lot of cost because you're, you're now having to re-engineer a, a stream where um, by not allowing it to engineer itself um, by just opening it back up. But it's a tough one. Um, we have a number of questions about cost, but I'm going to actually hold those because we actually have a section on cost and the cost benefits. And we are back um, right on time, although I have one more question. Um, well, here's, here's a question, um, and we'll end with this one and then jump into the next section, which where we're actually going to, Alex is going to talk about um, how we build these. So the BMP protocol manual says bank full width is achieved on average every one and a half years. How do you relate this to the usual 2.5 times, three times, three and a half times cross sectional requirements that are needed for a 25 or 35 year flow? Do you want to answer that now or do it after you go into the details of technical? I'll give a little simple answer to it now, but we can come back to it. And I would say also about all those, I love to talk about cost. And so I'll be very happy when we're, we're wrapping things up later um, after Sarah's had to talk about cost benefits and things to talk more about cost. I'm happy to do it. Um, so in this instance, when we're talking about relationship of the capacity of the crossing, that's what we're talking about 2.5, three times, however many times um, of the capacity of the crossing, that's the cross-sectional area, uh, which we'll I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, that is not about the width of the banks, really. So what happens is when a stream fills up to its banks, every one, one and a half years, whatever we want to call it, um, the water then, anytime it gets beyond that, it's getting out into its floodplain. Uh, and so the, the energy of the stream gets dissipated to a large extent by those natural floodplains. And so the problem with a crossing is inevitably it has to have a width of some sort. And by going to 1.2 times bank full, we're trying to give it what you might call these mini floodplains. Uh, but essentially, we're going to have to uh, make sure that those banks are really tough because the water is simply going to get deeper inside our crossing. It doesn't have access to floodplains. And so it does very much affect how we're going to um, design those things, but um, it, and it's not always easy to relate those capacities three times cross-sectional area to a discrete flow. Um, and I know that doesn't fully answer the question, but we'll come back to it. Um, and if anyone wants to further refine the question, I'm happy to take another crack at it later. Okay. That's great. Thank you. And I think this actually, that's a perfect lead in to the next section. And um, Alex is going to stick with us for this one. And he is going to walk us through how you actually make these things, uh, some of the technical aspects, what you have to look for and, and how we measure these things. Let me just pull it up. And I hope you're seeing it. Yep. Take it away. Okay, great. Thanks, Sarah. So this is sort of the technical part of things, but I realized in watching the video, as it was kind of painful for me to watch in a way, but um, I was thinking a lot about the fact that I've addressed a lot of the issues that are gonna come up here, but I think uh, repetition is really important. Um, it also help you to think about it slightly differently. I'll touch on a lot of similar or the same topics as I go through this, uh, but I wanted to mention one thing first that we haven't talked about. We have a program called Stream Smart, but it is really fundamentally based on a very well-developed program developed over decades ago by the US Forest Service called Stream Simulation Design. And I have to give them credit. Uh, we decided in Maine that the sort of thousand page manual that is uh, in that program, the five day introductory training that's required, that all of that is wonderful because it's a very in-depth program, what we tried to do was make things a little more straightforward, maybe simplify some elements of it to bring it to everyone so that everyone who is involved in road crossings uh, can understand a lot of these principles better. It really, in a way, boils down to the simple golden rule shown here. Let the stream act like a stream as much as possible, even given what I just said about the fact that we, we have a very hard time building a stream crossing, a culvert and a bridge that actually have floodplains in them that gets very, very expensive. So we're gonna do things um, uh, to address that. 
So one of the things I want to talk about right off the bat is that in StreamSmart, we have a whole bunch of options. We haven't necessarily talked about all of them. We've talked about a few, but not all of them. And so I want to touch on those here. And the first one, which we uh, didn't mention and is not obvious uh, at the outset, is if we can possibly avoid creating a crossing, we should do that because that's the best option of all. That's very smart. And when we think about forest crossings where uh, or new developments of a decent size, uh, it is really sensible and planners can be really good at finding their way not to cross a stream, to put in roads, uh, to build road networks so that they don't cross streams. And this is something that's being done all the time now where forest management companies are building new roads to access forests for cutting. Uh, and it should be done in any case where a new crossing is being considered because it's much cheaper to simply build a similar length of road than to build a stream crossing or to build one further upstream where it's smaller than downstream. The second option we did, I did mention in the video, and that was looking at temporary bridges. Uh, if you can remove a crossing that you don't really use all the time, uh, that is a fantastic thing. But I would say, of course, this doesn't really relate to town roads and state roads very well. Although I, I will say that there have been some town roads I've worked on in recent years, I won't name the towns, where I was recommending that they simply decommission the crossing. Um, but for all sorts of reasons, that was not the option chosen. Uh, but it is and should be considered one option. Uh, if the detour is really short, uh, it might be a great way to save money uh, in maintenance and construction over time. So really, though, what we're here to talk about is mainly option three, and that is the installation of open bottom structures that are stream smart. They expand, they uh, span the channel, really exceed the span of the channel. And so these are bridges, uh, bottomless three-sided box culverts, arch culverts, uh, as well as those uh, temporary bridge situations. And uh, just to clarify a little thing, because especially the DOT's definitions of bridge versus culvert, it gets a little confusing. And I consider a bridge uh, something that has a deck and the road runs right on top of it. And a culvert has fill on top of it and it can take all sorts of different forms. It's only when we get down to sort of number four here, when we think about our lower choice options, and that is to embed a culvert. I just mentioned in the video some of the advantages and disadvantages of those, and I'll return to them as we go along further. Um, this last item, I'm not sure it should even really be here, and I just spoke to it regarding the outlets of lakes, and that is when we have to design something that entails a lot of engineering, we call it a hydraulic design. It's really not fully stream smart because it doesn't actually accomplish all of our stream smart goals. It can be a way to get fish passage or passage of certain organisms, um, but it usually is limited in approach and scope. So I'm just gonna throw you some images here of some of these different structure types. There'll be a whole bunch of this uh, just to give you a sense of what some of these look like from temporary bridge decks and big bridges in the upper right. This one was put in in Washington last in town of Washington last summer. Uh, you can see, I think that that ladder there just to allow construction workers to get side to side is placed right on these beautiful little terrestrial uh, critter banks that are built into that otherwise very rocky surface under. The bottom left is our classic metal box. Um, and uh, sometimes this sort of shape can be built out of concrete as well. We'll show those. Uh, or the classic arch culvert. They all serve to fulfill stream smart principles. This is an embedded pipe that was installed in the town of New Gloucester a few years ago. Uh, I spooked a fox one week after it went in on the bank here uh, inside the crossing. Uh, we know those banks serve terrestrial critters uh, and we know they serve the stream really, really well. And in this case, it was, there was a lot of clay. And so it was really essential to use a closed bottom box, uh, pipe like this embedded in the stream channel to be able to distribute the load of the road and the traffic um, and all that overburden uh, effectively. So they do have their stream smart purposes. And some like this, uh, this is a clamshell concrete box. I mentioned it in the video. You have a bottom section that we were able to put in. Each piece weighed 40,000 some odd pounds. We had to use a crane. It added extra time and complication. The crane broke down. <laughs> uh, but the fact is we hope that this crossing in the town of Phillips might last even a hundred years. And so the robustness with which these pieces and the whole uh, bridge or box culvert were built um, really gives great advantages for longevity uh, and has all the other characteristics of a stream smart crossing and it's operating beautifully. Mary already mentioned this and I, I just have to say it again, some folks 
don't like it because the folks, for instance, who developed slip liners, um, were very proud of the fact that these are wonderful money saving measures. And what's interesting is that even though they make a smaller opening, uh, the, the bore of the pipe is now smaller than the old pipe they were inserted inside or uh, built up to replace. The fact is they can pass a lot of water, especially when they're smooth and plastic, but they're not stream smart. You end up still with the perch at the outlet. You end up with fast flowing water. You end up possibly with shallower water. Uh, they just don't serve the same purposes. What we're after in Stream Smart is trying to simplify things, as I said. And so we've come up with this little set of four S's, really five S's, see if you can find the five, fifth S. Uh, and those four S's are really meant just to give us uh, thumb um, guideposts, rules of thumb to stick to, to test whether we're really meeting stream smart principles. And the first we've talked about a lot already is spanning the stream and not pinching the stream. So this is an eight foot pipe in about a 18 foot stream or 16 foot stream. It's classic. Uh, it's what we're trying to avoid with stream smart. We don't want to pinch the stream. It's pretty basic. We want to span the stream. And clearly, as you've seen so much already, we want to exceed the span of the stream so that we can have banks inside the crossing. And you can see, <laughs> maybe I'm uh, guessing here a little bit, but this is a much happier stream uh, not being pinched down into that small crossing. Uh, so any of the critters that will pass in this stream upstream and down can pass through this stream smart crossing. I touched on this little element already in the video, but I just wanna come back to it because it's really important and helpful, I think, to remember that if you look in the upper right-hand corner, you, you see this overhead view of an undersized culvert. This is sort of the traditional undersized culvert. And think of it like a funnel. All that water basically gets stocked up in the open end of the funnel, trying to get into that narrow uh, part of the funnel and it inevitably speeds up. So if you look at the main part of the drawing here in the middle, water in a bigger flow is backing up at the inlet and then it flushes through that narrow opening at high velocity and it scours at the outlet with turbulence. Uh, and inevitably that has really fundamental effects in almost every case. Over time, you develop this perch, you scoured that material out uh, and piled it up into actually a secondary barrier. You don't just have the drop from the pipe, you actually have this area of fill material or stream material piled up that can be a secondary barrier to passage of fish and other aquatic organisms. So that's just, a, it's a classic. And here is a real world example in the town of Blanchard. We were lucky enough to uh, capture in photos. This is a 12 foot concrete box culvert put in about 2006, about two years before now. And already we know it had been developed, uh, put in, sorry, at the stream grade but it had already developed a perch in a very rocky uh, stream channel. And a couple of years later, we went back, whoop, let's see if I can get this to work. And the perch had expanded a lot just two years later. Uh, and that is because this crossing, as big as it may seem, is woefully undersized. This now has about a 40 foot or 35 foot bridge in this place that's working really, really wonderfully. Uh, but this is just a great example of how undersized culverts evolve uh, and to not work for the stream. Other key elements of our rules of thumb are getting the elevation right, setting the elevation right, and the slope and skew, that's our fifth S, match the stream. Skew meaning alignment, how the stream aligns with the road. And we have some really simple tests I'd like you to use whenever you come to a stream crossing and you're thinking about how well it works in terms of its elevation. So indicators, indicators of elevation problems are uh, coming to a crossing, looking downstream, you see a stream flowing. It's got all that wonderful wood in it that provides great additional habitat. You look upstream and you see a very different situation. You see a ponded area. You look at the inlet and outlet and you see the, it's about the same, really. Um, there's a little bit of water going in, coming out. It's not actually perched. You think, oh, this isn't so bad. But whenever you see this disconnect, this very different situation upstream and down, you know there's a problem usually with elevation. This is rarely natural. In this case, a bigger, better stream crossing was put in, stream smart design, open bottom arch, and the stream channel was rediscovered because the right kind of survey was done to get the right elevation to put in this new crossing. And that's the way the stream was meant to be. So forest will eventually regrow in that area, shade this beautiful little stream and provide the cool waters that our brook trout and salmon love. 
On the opposite end of the spectrum, if you come to a site like this and you look upstream and down and you see pretty much the same stream, you are a lot happier. You know that the elevation is, if not perfect, much closer for this particular crossing. You might notice that this crossing isn't great because it's not full of substrate. I can see metal corrugations in the bottom, but boy, if all of our stream crossings were like this, uh, we wouldn't have as many problems with stream connectivity as we do. What we're looking for is seamless inlets and outlets. We don't want to see a disruption in the stream channel. This is one that looks very raw because it was just finished last summer um, here in this photo. But you can see here, one of the nice little factors is those banks inside the crossing that serve a number of purposes. I'll come back to talking about more in a little bit, but uh, we want to see a lack of uh, no disruption in the stream. Our final S is substrate which is kind of the technical term I mentioned it in the video for sediment, the material in the stream bottom. And this, it cannot be overstated how important that natural substrate is in a crossing. If you look at a crossing like this, okay, it, it lacks banks, which is a little sad, but uh, otherwise having this natural substrate in the crossing makes the stream act in the crossing very much like it does upstream and downstream. You may not notice it or realize it, but every time the stream flow uh, comes past every one of these little rocks, cobbles, small boulders, you get immense varieties of velocity. You get these little eddies where any critter trying to move upstream through this crossing is going to be able to take advantage of those little eddies, those little changes in velocity. They may be using them partly to feed, to get food. They may be mostly using them to rest and to make their way to navigate through the crossing. And so I cannot overstate how important having natural substrate in a crossing and having it match the upstream and downstream areas is to a stream smart crossing. Okay, so how do we get there? It's really important uh, to break this down into a couple sections because the first step is field survey or assessment, we could say, and that has three different elements to it. We have a stream profile, cross sections, and the substrate assessment to try to figure out what the natural stream is like before we can get to design. And the step one is in the past is what has been underdone in many ways. And so I wanna really dwell on that now. You're gonna hear a lot more about it. And then we'll be able to get to some of the design issues that are really vital to Stream Smart. So our field survey uh, entailed, entailing these three parts, profile, cross sections and substrate, answers a lot of questions for us if we do it right. Our stream profile gives us our bed elevation, our slope, the potential for scour of the natural stream. So that means where we need to put our footings or abutments. Uh, it, it tells us about what kind of capacity structure we can build given the road height and what we need. Uh, cross sections tell us essentially about the width, but also about the shape of the stream um, and elevation of stream banks in relation to the stream bottom. And the substrate characterization or assessment tells us about that bed material size, but also can tell us a lot about what material we need to build the banks with so that they'll be stable over time. And the stream material, you need to remember when you think about stream smart and stream simulation design, which it's built on, spends a lot of energy and time on this, is you want a dynamic stream so that the material comes in and it moves out at the same way it would in a natural section of the stream. That's why it's so important. So step one of our field survey is working on our stream profile. We get out with a survey instrument and uh, I'm gonna give you several examples here of surveys and I'll even give you a little cartoon to show you how we do it. But the critical, critical thing is that we measure well upstream and downstream from the crossing in order to get enough information to be able to know uh, how to do a, a correct design. So our standard is 20 to 30 times the width of the stream in distance each way. So that translates for a 10 foot stream, like this one essentially is up here in the, in the little profile you see. A 10 foot stream, we need to go at least 200 feet up and 200 feet down. That's 400 feet, which we've just exceeded on this one. But really more like 600 feet is probably a better number um, for any of these crossings. Okay? It's really important to go far enough. Uh, and it just it doesn't take much extra time, money, anything to get that bit of information that is really helpful. And this is the, my cartoon about how you do it. It's pretty simple. The white shows the stream bottom as well as the road elevation. The green is the little instrument we're gonna to use to survey. The culvert is orange um, in place and the water level is a uh, little, uh, is thrown in there as well. You can notice that the outlet of this culvert goes down into a pretty deep pool. It doesn't seem to match any of the other pools 
in the stream, right? That is totally normal with an undersized stream crossing. It's an anomalous, unrepresentative uh, pool. It does tell us a little something about what can happen under severe conditions in this stream, and that can teach us a little bit of something. But the survey process is really simple. Uh, depending on what kind of survey instrument you use, you, all you're trying to do is capture the highs and the lows. In a, in a pool and riffle stream, which a lot of our streams are in Maine, you're going to be capturing the top of the riffle and the deepest part of the pool. Top of riffle, deepest part of pool. And that's essentially all we're trying to capture because that tells us so much. If we connect the top of those features from the natural stream upstream, where we've gone well upstream to well downstream, it gives us our stream slope. And that's great. And it gives us the elevation uh, around the cr stream crossing of where we think our stream elevation will be, the top of our stream. And if we connect the bottom of those features, the bottom of the, the average bottom of those pools, we're going to know how deeply this stream tends to scour inside its banks um, based on all the storms that have happened in that stream in however many years it's been going as it has. So that's critical, critical information. And you simply don't learn it if you don't go far enough away from the road because that area around the road is disturbed. This gives us the information we need to put in a new, larger, lower stream crossing to stream smart standards. So let's look at a couple examples, more examples of stream profiles because there's a really classic signature that comes from these profiles. And so I want you to learn a little bit about how to read them right here. If you like this kind of stuff, uh, you'll be really into it. I love this stuff. If you don't love it, I hope you can pick up a few important rules of thumb. Notice the stream bottom in brown there. Notice the uh, gray dashed line. That's the one that's meant to connect the upstream natural portions of the stream way downstream to the natural stream uh, and trying to connect those gives us a 0.7% slope. And you'll notice that there's a whole bunch of the brown material and the culvert itself well above that line. It tells us this culvert is not at the right elevation and that material is accumulated upstream and often downstream, partly from being scoured out of that deep scour pool, partly maybe from all the little road washouts that had happened um, by this culvert being too small for its stream. And then look at the red dash line that we don't have a perfect data here, but connecting the stream bottoms roughly gives us in a parallel, roughly parallel line to the, to the top of the stream features, the typical scour that this stream uh, undergoes. And just take a moment to <laughs> look again at that scour pool. It is completely anomalous. It may look similar to the big one downstream, but in fact, this is about almost four feet deep versus the one downstream, which is about two feet deep. Uh, and so this is really uh, very anomalous for this stream and it's all about stream elevation and undersized culvert pipe. Here's another one. This is in the town of Phillips. This is one of my favorite sites. Uh, that's a two and a half foot pipe, a 30, uh, uh, 30 inch pipe in what is about an eight foot stream. What I'd like you to notice first is the, on the bottom of the graph, notice how far we went to survey this little stream. We went a hundred times the stream width. And frankly, it wasn't much more difficult than going 30 times upstream and 30 times downstream. Uh, but what we got from going that far is to the ability to connect this gray dash line from the truly undisturbed area upstream to the truly undisturbed area downstream. And as with the previous one, you notice all of this material is accumulated uh, in part because of the culvert being set too high and it's too small. Uh, this is a very messy site. The road commissioner in the town of Phillips lives up the road and past this site every day and every year had to deal with problems from this undersized crossing. And so we came in to help. And uh, he and we were very happy not to do it the old way. If we had done it the old way, we would have looked upstream from the road 50 feet and downstream, surveyed it maybe in detail, and we would have got the slope kind of right, but the elevation would have been totally wrong because we would have been looking essentially at the current elevation of the culvert. If we'd done it the minimum, minimum standard, going 20 times upstream and 20 times downstream, we would have got the slope close to right too, and the elevation would have been better, lower. But still, we would have been reading a disturbed stream, a stream that was really messed up for decades by an undersized culvert. So we went further. And it does take a little time to develop the sort of skill to understand what you're looking at in the field. But I have to say that it is so easy to go a little bit further. It is so critical 
capture that extra bit of information that tells us where the natural stream is and what that then tells us about how to design the right elevation, the green dashed line here, which is about three feet lower than the existing culvert and uh, not to mention the sizing, which we'll get to uh, along the way. This, this stream profile is critical. The next step is cross sections to get at sizing. And the simplest way to do that, this is a graphic comes from a best management practice manual of the Maine Forest Service, I believe, is to take simple measurements from bank to bank. You get, you're measuring the width at normal high water or perhaps the bank full width, as we call it, often right at the base of the woody vegetation on the sides of the stream. This is where normally when water every year, every year and a half or so gets up and starts heading out into the floodplain. Um, you're measuring that width several times to get an average. And across those uh, measurements, you're gonna take average depth measure. You're gonna take depth measurements and then average them. In this most simple form, you've got a six foot wide stream with an average of one foot depth. That's a six foot uh, square foot cross-sectional area for this one little stream. So when you're talking about trying to meet the state standards, uh, you'd be talking about three times that. Uh, or when you're talking about stream smart, I would throw out a rule of thumb to you five times that to get closer to stream start smart characteristics if you're really trying to pass larger flows. Let's just reflect on that for a moment. So you, we are not necessarily being forced by state law and regulation to meet uh, the highest standard. Um, but what we're talking about in Stream Smart is trying to achieve a higher standard that will truly make our roads better protected and more resilient over time to a higher standard. A, a more complex looking crossing is a little bigger one. This is almost 17 feet across in the town of Farmington uh, using a, a more uh, um, sophisticated survey instrument gives us a little more detail. Um, 17 foot wide, two and a half foot depth, uh, maximum depth in this case of what a 42 square foot uh, cross-sectional area. And it is at any one of these cross-sections that normally, uh, we do them always in riffles when there's a, the riffles and pools in a stream, uh, we will do what we call a pebble count. This is where we do our substrate assessment. And we do a randomized measurement, uh, a randomized selection of pieces from the stream, and we measure them. And that gives us a distribution of material. This is a perfect example to use here because in this crossing uh, being designed, uh, it's going to be put in this coming summer, uh, the engineer who is, did the final designs wants to put in a big embedded clamshell concrete box. And uh, in order to rebuild the stream, which will have to be done inside that box, we have to have this distribution information to know how to match the natural stream character. Okay, Whew, that's a lot of assessment. I, I'd love to talk about that all day, but uh, I want to get into design and design starts in some ways and or maybe this comes later uh, thinking about what your options are for structure types and there are many and it's wonderful I could also talk about this all day but just want to give you some sense of some of the variety of structure choices that you have. Uh, the upper left is what we call an open bottom box. This is built out of concrete blocks, uh, extremely robust, flexible in its sort of Lego nature um, and built the right way, armored well. It can be extremely stable uh, and wonderful. The arch in the upper right is also concrete and will be set on the same sort of abutments or, or footings. The lower right is our open bottom box culvert in metal. Often it's the most wonderful thing about it is it comes on a small flatbed truck in many pieces. Uh, the scary part is that some of them, when they're built uh, at a large size, can have thousands, three or 4,000 uh, nuts and bolts to put it together. Um, but each one of these different structure types has its advantages and disadvantages. The pipe arch in the lower right uh, is key to uh, putting in embedded pipes and distributing load in weak soils, especially. And these often also come in a multi-plate uh, variety that need to be assembled. But you've got your bridges, like I showed earlier, you've got this, this embedded pipe in the upper right is one of those multi-plate uh, pipe arches that was put in in New Gloucester. The bottomless concrete box in the lower right is in that stream that I just dwelt on a lot with that stream profile with the two and a half foot pipe elevated three feet too high. Uh, and so this is in place now operating really well in the town of Phillips. And in Whitefield in the lower left is one of these concrete arches, all examples of the kind of variety you can have of different structure types for stream smart. Here's a good example of a site that you saw before in the upper right hand corner that don't pinch a stream photo, totally 
restored uh, to good connection upstream to down. Uh, the old eight foot pipe is noted in red essentially in the photo. And you see the cross section that is there in white was not very well represented by the previous pipe at all. And so now it is in this big open bottom arch culvert with banks in it, passing huge storms with ease. Some of those are more and less expensive than others. This is a good example of how inexpensively you can do work on low volume roads. These can be forest roads. In this case, it's a very little used town road. Uh, and this can be true for driveways and other places as well. We had a terribly functioning multiple culvert before that was perched and not working well for the stream. And now we have this dramatically bigger crossing. This was less than $12,000, it was a few years ago, but extremely inexpensive because it had used steel I-beams that are plenty strong enough for the loads that are being put here. A timber deck in this case that yes, needs to be maintained, but is extremely inexpensive uh, to build. So there are lots of options for different types of roads. This is one I showed earlier. This is in the town of Phillips. Uh, a failing crossing, you'll see several images of this coming up, um, in which the town spent its pretty much its entire road budget for the year to put in this incredibly strong embedded concrete box culvert. This was in the age before uh, they later got some access to DEP culvert upgrade grant funding for other crossings uh, in town. And so they spent a lot of money on this, but the reason they did it is because the road commissioner knew how many problems there were with this crossing and that the stream smart solution was the right solution for the long term. It was the right investment for the town and they don't have a lot of uh, tax income. So they were thinking about the dollars all the way along and chose to make this choice as an investment, not just in the stream, uh, that was true, but certainly for the roads for the town. This is that three-sided box culvert I showed before in Phillips, the pipe as it looked before. And now, uh, again, no need to say much more about this, although again, this was very inexpensive, just up the road from that previous crossing. Uh, we came in with help from the US Fish and Wildlife Service refuge crew uh, who came out to teach the town with their new excavator how to do this kind of installation uh, properly so that they could then do it on a whole bunch of other crossings throughout the town themselves without a lot of extra help. And it was extremely inexpensive. In Whitefield, uh, different crossing looks very similar in terms of pipe size and uh, degraded nature uh, of the crossing. This was one of the first DEP culvert upgrade bond grants given um, with a great solution, Stream Smart. And along the way, when we're doing our designs, you're inevitably going to come up with an, an elevation like this showing the inlet of the crossing or maybe the outlet. I just want to show you this one because it shows you the relative scale of change that sometimes happens. This once again is that little crossing in Phillips that was three feet too high um, and way too small. It was about five square feet previously, passing very little water, causing all sorts of problems for the road and the stream. It's now been increased about 10 times uh, that Yes, it seems dramatic, but in fact, as I just said, this was actually quite inexpensive uh, and the town never really needs to worry about this crossing again for what might be a hundred years, according to some folks who uh, have assessed the situation. Okay, I can talk all day again about these structures, but I want to get on to other really key elements of the design process. And each one of these could, could entail lots and lots of talk. I am not a professional hydrologist, but we do hydrology when we do our basic plans for stream smart and engineers out there uh, do this as well. And we are so lucky to have a set of tools available from the US Geological Survey that allow us to get data on any stream crossing uh, in the state for design purposes. So if you look here, that label, looking at site 10405 in the town of Porter's pointing to that red dot, uh, we can go in with our set of tools online free and generate that drainage area. Just essentially by clicking on the point, you can generate that yellow drainage area for that particular point. And not just that, but a whole slew of data that comes along with us, with it. It tells you how big that drainage area is and a number of other important factors that relate to it. But key is on the right here, it tells us for different return periods, essentially different storm sizes uh, that happen at different frequencies or different probabilities. In this case, it's old data. If you see the 100, on the lower left, the second to last row, that is meant in this data to represent the 100 year storm event. It's a storm that has a 1% chance of happening in a given year. And 
the flow estimate that comes with that storm from this watershed. Uh, that's a lot of cubic feet per second to be handling in your crossing, and that's what we're trying to design for. And so we have another free set of tools um, that comes from the US Federal Highway Administration, and I've conferred, um, actually been trained by a professional hydraulic engineer in Maine who uh, uses some much more sophisticated modeling programs uh, to do this kind of design work, but he assures me and us that this program called HY8 for most simple culvert uh, situations does a wonderful job of estimating the hydraulic uh, forces, the energy, the velocities of flow, all uh, and the elevation of the water for our design uh, for stream smart crossings. And so we use it all the time. And just for you to understand a little bit about what's happening here, the graphic on the left shows you on, on the left side of the graphic and a water elevation coming into the crossing and as a light bl a blue line that represents where the water elevation will be during a 100-year storm event, according to our current design. And we can do this. It's really easy to iterate this uh, with lots of different designs. You can go wider. You can go higher. You can go um, all sorts of different uh, ways with your design and get different results uh, that are essentially posted on the right-hand side. So you can look at the depth of water, look at the estimated velocity of the flow during even that 100-year storm, which in this case is extremely reasonable for some fish, even though most fish during a big storm like that are not moving much, they're hunkered down trying to protect themselves. But the good news is that even at that big flow, we are designing things with space to spare. As I mentioned before, we want to leave space both sort of for conservatism in terms of thinking ahead to climate change, but also passing debris during those big storms because that is how the Freeport culvert failed that is how the DOT crossing up in Carabasas Valley failed. That is how many culverts fail because it's during those big storms that the debris comes down and we should pass it through our stream smart crossings. Wow, okay. So I wanna stop here for a moment. We're gonna have a few more slides for sure, but to pause and think about other design and installation considerations. In the permitting section, you already heard about this, but I just want to reiterate, you need to start early in talking to the various folks who might have jurisdiction over your stream crossing. It is extremely helpful. Uh, they are extremely helpful to talk to about what you need to do for permits. Remembering that the in-stream work window, as several folks have mentioned, going back to, I think Mary mentioned it maybe earlier, is uh, July 15th to September 30th is the work window for most stream crossings in the state of Maine. Your plans, whenever you're trying to do a stream smart crossing design, you really need to have all of that data shown uh, in appropriate way. Not necessarily in my cartoonish way, in my concept designs, but in perhaps in CAD programs or something else to show the stream profile, to show cross-sectional area, to show peak flow elevations from your hydraulic modeling. All of that needs to feed in both to the permitting, but also to uh, just understanding how well your stream smart crossing is going to work and be built. Uh, other folks have mentioned it again previously, but we, I cannot overstress how critical controlling water and sedimentation during construction is. It is uh, done really well by some folks and some folks just um, don't spend enough time on it. So we'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, there are other issues to be dealt with as well, thinking about uh, when you have special situations of lots of bedrock in your stream to work around that in your design unstable soils uh, where you really should be doing geotechnical work, that is borings usually, to assess the subsurface materials to know what the bearing capacity of those soils are. That's not something you can just do with an easy rule of thumb. And finally, building bed and banks, I'll come back to in a couple minutes because I think it's really critical um, to do well. So here's one of my cartoon drawings. This is a water control plan for that little site in Phillips uh, where we had a lot of problems and it just gives you some of the basic elements to think through when you're thinking about controlling water. We don't know when the weather is going to be coming during construction and uh, yes sometimes we can simply stop construction or move it but often we can't so we need to build in a lot of safety and so we think about You'll see these block nets here. We actually screen fish. We keep fish out of the site. And in this area, which is uh, known to have Atlantic salmon in it, we actually fish the site with an electrofishing unit and move fish out of the construction zone ahead of time. Uh, we have those coffer dams in place to control flow. And we are either pumping, as we did here, around the site to maintain stream flow. 
uh, or we're having a bypass. I'll show you some examples of that in a moment. And we're filtering the dirty water out uh, in an effective filtration system. And there are a number of them to use. Um, in this case, I was being a bit creative by using this swale out to the side to filter some of the water. We ended up having to switch that and use another portion of the forest to filter. Um, you always wanna be thinking about having adequate pump capacity, hose lengths. It's really simple stuff, but if you don't think it through, you're not gonna be ready uh, when uh, construction happens. So when you have big streams like this, in this case, coffer dams are actually isolating the footings on the outside of the stream. And essentially the stream itself is bypassing right down the middle because it was essentially too big to control with pumps. In this case, this is the big uh, site of the big embedded concrete box culvert in Phillips where the construction uh, crew, the engineer decided to have a bypass channel specially built to carry beautiful clean water from this stream down and around the muddy mess that they were making um, to dig that deep, deep hole to put in the embedded concrete box. But the isolation was pure and complete and wonderful. And all that dirty water though had to go somewhere. And so it got filtered out in the floodplain with a number of these filtration basins uh, to keep the dirty water out of the stream. Ah, so okay, here's my one of my favorite topics. Um, and I've been working really hard on it in recent years, like last year. Uh, uh, this is the Deer Go Timberlands construction crew in Charleston, where we built five crossings with them last year. Uh, and here I want to show you a little bit about the process of, uh, of installing banks, not so much bed, but banks alone. And that always entails a layering effect. And here I want you to see the size of spread footings that we sometimes put in. Uh, to distribute the load of abutments across a, a less than ideal soil. So this is a spread footing. And we want, we know from our careful survey, our stream profile, uh, that this footing is below the level of likely scour for this stream, even with the, a factor of safety put in. And still, what we're gonna do is pile rock on top of those footings. Uh, and what you can't see here on the right is an entire layer of this rock that's been carefully sized uh, by looking at the natural stream channel and by doing other uh, processes of estimation um, using formulas, formulas some like one from the Army Corps of Engineers to make sure that these pieces will be stable even in big flows. And we put down a layer of that material. We then layer fines on top of it. And if we have water available, we are watering those fines in to fill the voids in the big rock material. I'm gonna to talk to you more about why we do that, but it's, it's an important element of building good banks. We then put more rock on and more fines shown over here to the right as we work on the left side as well. Two layers, coarse rock underneath, fines and then rock on top uh, and all that to build these final banks. You don't even notice how much is going on underneath these banks, but believe me, we work very hard to make them extremely robust um, because those banks serve three really critical purposes. I spoke to this a little bit in the video. First, those banks give us the right shape of the stream that matches our cross sections that we did. So we have a natural stream where when the water gets really low, and this is closed for construction, but when the water starts flowing and it's low in the summer, it gets focused to a narrower section of channel uh, in, in the middle instead of just being spread out like it does in a Conquer, traditional concrete box culvert with no substrate in it. But also, of course, we've talked a lot about it, that material uh, in the foundation of the banks is armoring our abutments and our footings against the really big flows to maintain these banks and to protect the, to the footings and uh, abutments. But critical also is that we want to be able to pass over time sustainably uh, terrestrial critters like the one you might be able to see here. We want to make sure all four corners of these banks are connected to the natural stream banks. Otherwise, it's kind of what's the point? We want them to be connected at all four corners. And too often, the last phase of construction entails a lot of dumping of riprap that ends up closing off these corners a little bit. Um, notice this wildlife. <laughs> it's not exactly wildlife, but during construction, a house cat came by and I thought it was a perfect example to capture um, because in fact, we do see all the time animals I think one of the figures I've seen is 85% of uh, terrestrial critters uh, in, in your watershed 
travel at some time along stream channels. Maybe they're just getting a drink of water, maybe they're hunting, uh, but they use stream channels and they do not prefer to go up over a road when they can go under a crossing like this. And so that's one of the elements of stream smart design that we're always trying to work hard on. But as much as I've said, I like to talk about this stuff and it's, I think it's pretty obvious to you, I do. I love it, in fact. Uh, we don't have all day. And so I'm gonna leave you with a few comments here. You'll have a chance to ask more questions. We can have a discussion uh, at the end of today's workshop, but you're gonna have questions. Uh, if you're new to Stream Smart survey, design, permitting, installation, when are you gonna seek help? In any of that realm of new, being new to Stream Smart, you're probably gonna seek help. But there are lots of other situations, such as represented, for instance, by the photo in the background, you may have a stream site, uh, crossing site that's been completely wiped out and you'll need help trying to discern what happened here, what, where the natural stream is. You may have geotechnical challenges that go beyond certainly my skills and you need to confer on what to do with your bedrock or clay subsurface materials. Tidal streams, uh, Mary mentioned early on in this, are really critical to getting sea run fish up in some cases excuse me, to their upstream spawning areas, but they're also simply critical for salt marshes and their correct operation. And this approach in StreamSmart doesn't really address the depth of uh, additional layers of assessment and uh, construction elements that are important for tidal stream crossings. And so we're lucky to have this new program coming soon to Maine called, uh, excuse me, called Coastwise, which is essentially a sister program to StreamSmart specifically focused at tidal streams. You should get help on tidal streams. And finally, there are all sorts of safety and traffic issues that come into play uh, sometimes in design. If you're working on a busy road like DOT always is, uh, they often need to stage construction and you may need to too. You may need to create a bypass road or you may need to do other things to maintain traffic flow uh, that do add logistical challenges to any stream crossing, let alone stream smart. I hope though, in the end, you'll remember our four S's or five S's uh, to keep things relatively simple. Remember these rules of thumb and remember most of all, the golden rule of stream smart to let the stream act like a stream. Now, thank you for your time. I think Sarah, you can come on back. I'll give you back control and maybe we can have a discussion about- We're gonna. Um, we have a few good questions in the Q&A, but what we're going to do first is run through this last segment, and then we'll open it up to all the questions. Um, thank you, Alex. That was fantastic. Great. Sorry about that. Uh, no, this is great. Um, so we're going to run through the last bit, which is what a lot of people have been asking questions about already. Um, it's the financial bit. So, um, and there were a couple of good questions that hopefully will be answered when we... Um, jump into this Let's go ahead and share. And I am going to be joined um, by John McLean. He's the administrator for the, the Department of Environmental Protection's um, culvert replacement uh, grant program. Let's get going. So um, a lot of questions in the, the question and answer box. Keep them coming. Um, a lot of those questions were on costs or as you might think of it, that's great, but how do we pay for all this? There are a lot of folks who are like, yeah, I'd love to do that, but, but this, is, this is an expensive endeavor. So I wanna run through some of the cost benefit um, calculations on stream smart design. And we do hear from towns a lot in particular because of, but really for everyone looking at stream smart when we're replacing a small culvert, the upfront costs for stream smart design is higher. That's, that's a fact. Um, we're, we're putting in bigger structures basically to, to allow the stream to act like a stream. And a lot of particularly municipalities, you may have an annual budget and maybe be very limited and you don't wanna be thinking, am I gonna plow the roads this winter or am I gonna have a, a stream smart design? Um, and so I wanna go through some of, the, um, some of the opportunities that there are. We also do get some folks who are like, we know how to put in crossing structures. We've been doing this for decades. And there was actually a great question in the Q and A I said, you know, I've heard from the town who says uh, it's cheaper to just keep replacing the culverts, let them wash out, and then we just replace them. It's cheaper than to do that than to put in one of these big, fancy, expensive stream smart designs. And I'm, I'm hoping that at the end of this, you will change your mind on that, or, or they will change their mind on that. And we really need to think about it in the big picture and for the long term, not just um, one year at a time. 
and we're really getting to a point where we can't afford to not use stream smart designs. We have public safety that we need to think about it about in these stream crossings, but we also have the economic risks that we're uh, that we need to think about when we have road closures. Um, we've already talked about climate change a couple of times. We are seeing bigger, more frequent storms already, and we we need to to start building towards that. Um, and then you need to think about your maintenance costs year after year after year. Shoring up your your undersized culvert is going to, in the long haul, be more expensive than just putting in a good crossing. And there is financial assistance out there. There are a lot of different programs, depending on where you are, what your resources are, and what the situation is, that you can get help in. Um, putting in stream smart crossings. The one factor that you will find in most of those is that they require stream smart design. You, it's a lot harder to get money to just keep putting in small um, pipes. So some of these uh, public safety community costs, you have to think about the immediate threat of the road collapsing. Um, that's a, that's a, a clear public safety issue. But you also have to think about if you, if you have to close a road because it gets um, overtopped regularly. Now you have to think about your emergency vehicle detours and, and what harm is that putting your public, um, or what harm is potentially happening with, with the public with those detours. And you can end up with individuals and communities who end up isolated. We saw that with Hurricane Irene, whole sections of Vermont were cut off for weeks. And that's that has huge public safety implications. So those are sort of the obvious thing. But you also need to think about the economic impact. If your road is failing a lot, you're spending a lot of money um, shoring it up, replacing those small culverts, um, closing the roads, having um, folks out there to, to maintain that closure. Um, but you also have to think about your community. You have to think about your businesses. If your businesses can no longer get access to their, um, their goods and, and services, they can't get their staff to work and they can't get their customers in, that costs them money. So in the big picture, it is, it's not just the cost of that culvert, it's the, all of the economic implications for the area. And over time, repeated flooding affects property values. And so again, real world, real time economic impacts of repeated flooding. And we've already talked about how climate change is, is increasing extreme precipitation events. This was um, this is data that was collected just using the weather stations all across the country. Going back to 1948, between 1948 and 2011, New England has seen the highest change in size and frequency of these annual large annual storms. You can see that by the size of the dots. Maine in particular is seeing um, annual storms, the largest annual storms increasing by 23% in that time and the frequency by 74%. So they're happening almost twice as often and a quarter again bigger than they had been. So we have to stop building roads like it's 1950 because the weather isn't the same as it was in 1950. And that's leading a lot of folks to, to look at this, not just fish passage, um, but also flood risk and how can we evaluate that and how can we prioritize our crossings. So the Nature Conservancy is using a lot of the data that um, Mary showed on that map with the dots showing all the culverts across the whole state, using that information from actual um, measurements and then doing some modeling with GIS and other things to evaluate all of those and say, well, what happens in, um, what would happen in a 25 year flood so that we can prioritize which of these crossings have fish passage issues and are at high flood risk so that we know where to start. They're hoping to put out an actual tool like the, the map that Mary showed that's available now, but this would include not just fish passage, but also that flood risk. So we're hoping to have that out um, and available to the public um, soon. And this is this is, gets to that question of the upfront cost versus the long-term costs. Yes, stream smart crossings are usually more expensive. It depends, but they are usually more expensive. We're putting in a bigger structure, but you need to look at the costs over time because it isn't just that one-time upfront cross uh, cost. The graph on the bottom right there shows the comparison of costs over 50 years. The blue line that sort of slants up is your standard round pipe. And it's much cheaper than the stream smart arch or box crossing, as you can see, because they're much higher for their initial costs. 
But once you put in those stream smart crossings, you don't go back to them. There's no additional maintenance costs. You're not replacing them for 50, within that 15 year time span. But you see that the blue traditional arch or um, pipe that line goes up because there's annual maintenance costs and then you're gonna be replacing that more frequently. And those replacements actually do cost and they add up. And at the end of 50 years, you're, you've spent more money with a poorer functioning system and an increase in public safety issues and all the other things that I just talked about um, to save a little money up front. But in the end, it costs you more, even in if you were only looking at the crossing itself. In Massachusetts, they did the same sort of examination. They found that um, it was almost 40% cheaper over 30 years to use a stream smart type crossing compared to a traditional small round pipe. So there is help available to defray those costs because it may be great that over 50 or 100 years, it's gonna be cheaper, but you still need that money up front. You still need the money to put it in. So there are places you can go. There, there are a lot of different places and they all depend on, um, some are available for different project proponents. Some are more available um, depending on the aquatic resources that are, that are there, um, how much improvement you expect to get out of for that aquatic resource. Uh, where you are in the state, there are some resources available in some parts of the states and not other others. Um, there is usually a requirement for additional funds. So they, these programs usually don't pay the entire cost for the crossing. So if you're a town, you may have to put some time money in or get additional funds from, from other programs to piece together. Um, and of course, like everything having to do with funding, it all depends on the year and what's available and, and what's going on um, economically. But one of the most consistent things is that all of this financial system, assistance requires StreamSmart design to even be eligible. And just to run through a, a, a few of these places where there is um, funding available, um, and then I'll touch specifically on one and I'm gonna have John McLean uh, talk about the DEP program. Uh, the Natural Resources Conservation Service or NRCS has a number of regional conservation partnership programs and I'll, I'll touch on that in a minute. Um, and that is specifically for private landowners. NOAA often has grant funds available for stream crossings um, because as Mary showed, Maine's the last place with viable Atlantic salmon habitat. And so it's really to restore those habitats and, and access. Um, the Maine Natural Resource Conservation Program sometimes has funding. It depends on where you are and what funding they have available. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has a program called Partners for Fish and Wildlife. They're sort of between staffing, so that program's on hold now, but we hope that that will come back as well. And then sometimes NGOs have funding available if it's in a target area that they're working in, Trout Unlimited, um, the Nature Conservancy, Atlantic Salmon Federation. Often there are funds available through the National Fisheries and Wildlife Foundation. Um, so there are a lot of places that you can piece together um, funding. And then of course, there's the main DEP stream crossing up upgrade grant program. That is for municipalities specifically. And we'll have a little segment by John McLean on that in just a second. I just want to specifically touch on the Natural Resources Conservation Service Program of the RCPP, the Regional Conservation Partnership Program. This is a partnership program, so they usually um, include a number of different partners, and a lot of them are the partners that I listed at the very, very start of the day. All of these different partners that work on Stream Smart Crossings. NRCS itself provides that technical and financial assistance. They will go out and do the surveys and, and figure out the design and provide funding for the crossing itself. It is geared solely at private landowners. This is not available for towns. It is a voluntary program. It's competitive. So you really need to have um, good aquatic resources in the area that you are benefiting through the crossing replacement. It is a reimbursement program. So they don't just hand you the cash. They reimburse you at a flat rate that they have standard tables on. Um, and there are currently two of these RCPP programs in Maine and another one in the works. They're both, because the two that are here now are both sort of at the end of their um, time span. The first one is in blue over here in the Western mountains of Maine. And that one and that project ends this year, but they've spent about $200,000 for aquatic organism passage projects, which is replacing culverts to allow fish passage. 
Um, so this was just about done. And I, I wish I had the numbers on how many projects that they did, but they did a number of projects and they've spent out that 200,000. The other is a larger program and it's outlined here in red. It's almost the entire state except for Aristic and Cumberland County. They had $4 million. It's being led by the Nature Conservancy. They still have another year and they have put in a ton of, of different projects all over this project area. Um, again, that project ends next year. They still have a few um, sites left that they're looking at for this year and next. But then there's another RCPP being proposed by a group of partners to get going after this year. That would be we're estimating about twice as big as the one that that we have outlined here in red. And um, if that gets approved, that could be a, a substantial um, amount of funding available and looking at really reconnecting whole systems and looking at private and um, public roadways and crossing structures. So that would be really exciting if that comes through. And we hope that we'll hear about that this year. There's a ton of information available on our website that is um, streamsmartmaine.org. There is a handout with links to some of these resources, technical and financial resources, the RCPP and um, DEP's grant program as well. So I want to now switch over to John's program on the DEP grant program, because I know that a lot of folks have, have used that and it is a fantastic program that um, many of us have worked to make sure is funded every year. Hi everyone, I'm glad to be here with you today for the Stream Smart Phase One workshop. My name is John McLean and I'm the administrator of the Maine DEP Municipal Stream Crossing Grants Program. In today's workshop, I'll share some basic information about DEP funding for municipal stream crossing projects and some basics to help you make the best of your application. To date, the program has awarded over $15 million in funding for stream crossing upgrades, matched by other funding sources. There will be $4 million in grants available in 2021. Now, this is a competitive program and the scoring is based on how well the project meets the program's goals. For this round, the maximum award amount is $125,000 per project. Grant scoring is based on the project's contribution to competitive grant program goals, including that it improves public safety and reduces flooding, it advances the goals of restoring habitat for fish, including sea run fish and native brook trout, and wildlife, and it represents an efficient and cost-effective investment. Now I'll give you a hint. Most of these criteria can be attained by proposing, designing, and installing stream smart road crossings. There are some elements you can't change, like presence of salmon, but a good stream crossing design will alleviate flooding, help restore habitat and fisheries, and is a good investment when done properly. On the safety and flooding portions of the proposal, which accounts for 25% of the total score, our scoring will consider the extent to which the proposed project allows communities to more effectively prepare for storm and flood events. The urgency, the degree of urgency of the proposed proje project, including whether a culvert is at high risk of failure due to age, condition, location within a watershed or reach with a high flood risk or severe flood history, and the contribution to stormwater and flooding management the reduction in frequency or severity of flooding for upstream and downstream communities, and whether the project meets or exceeds the Department of Transportation's 100-year flood standard. The Fish and Wildlife section accounts for 50% of the total score. Some of this section's aspects overlap with other elements, but this is the biggest section, so the more information you can get here, the better your chances. Scoring for this section is based on the extent to which the proposed project advances the goals for, of restoring habitat for fish, including sea run fish and native brook trout, the priority status of the culvert to be upgraded or replaced for native brook trout and sea run fish restoration based on available stream survey data, statewide prioritization for aquatic connectivity, and presence in priority watersheds of salmon, alewives, and other diadromous fishes. We're also looking that the project advances the goals of restoring habitat for wildlife, such as 
with design features like stream banks for terrestrial passage. We want to see that the design standard of at least 1.2 times the stream's bank full width is met with a natural stream bottom or an embedded structure. Spend some time really looking into the information that's available at our fingertips. From the mainstream habitat viewer to our state's fisheries biologist to Maine's beginning with habitat program, which offers maps on fish and wildlife habitat in the state. For the cost section, which is the final 25% of the score, we consider the extent to which the proposed project represents an efficient and cost-effective investment, including the proportion of total project funding that will be provided from other sources, the potential avoided costs associated with the proposed project, and other efficiencies showing the project is a good investment of public money. I'd highly encourage you to apply for the funding if you have any issues that we've talked about. But in order to be competitive, you'll have to put in some legwork to show that the crossing will be stream smart. To apply, you must qualify, and to qualify, the project must be located on a municipal road, not a state or private road. And the crossing must be a culvert. Bridges are currently not eligible for the program. Eligible project sponsors include local governments, municipal conservation commissions, soil and water conservation districts, and private nonprofit organizations. To give a little bit of predictability, here's our plan for the next round of grants. The request for proposals or RFP and application will be available in late summer of this year, with applications set to be due in mid-November. Check back for the exact dates as we haven't yet established those. We will also keep our website up to date with these as we have the information. You can also email me at the email at the end of this presentation. Once again, my name is John McLean, and if you'd like to make sure you get information about grants or the upcoming deadlines, send me an email. If you send a question during the open period of the RFP, which will be later this summer, I won't be able to directly answer your questions, but I will list the question and the answer on the RFP page. Thank you, and I look forward to seeing your excellent proposals this fall. Okay, thank you, John. Um, that We have covered so much this morning for everyone. Now is your chance to pepper us with questions or just absorb with what we have just shared with you. We do have some good questions in the Q&A box. I don't know if um, panelists want to turn on their, their screen, so I don't feel alone up here. Um, and we can go through some of these questions. And I hope that, that the couple of questions on costs were addressed in the, the little bit that I did. I really do think in the big picture, the cost, the cost benefit analysis shows that the stream smart crossings are much more beneficial. Um, there were a couple of questions about the technical aspects of um, how do you measure bankful width and things like that. Um, I want to put in a plug for another stream smart training that, that we often do, that Alex is off and on and some of the other um, partners here. And we call it a phase two, it's a field training, field-based training. This is our phase one introductory workshop. And we, in the fall, usually do a couple of two-day field-based trainings. Um, and hopefully we will be able to do it this year. Hopefully we will all be vaccinated and able to, to get together again. Um, we actually take you out in the field. We teach you how to measure the stream. We teach you how to, to, to collect all the information. And then we actually have you use the software and design a stream smart um, design. So it's really exciting. Um, I don't know, Alex, if you want to get into any of the specifics of um, some of one of the questions was, are there different ways to measure bank full width or um, a guidance document to go to? other than everything that's on streamsmartmain.org, of course, because there are a lot of resources there. Well, I, I, like I said in my presentation earlier, I could talk about this stuff all day, but I think really there's just nothing that substitutes uh, for getting out in the field. And so my first pump would be for somebody attending, if they really wanna know about assessment, how to measure bank for width, um, to get to one of those phase two trainings. Um, but certainly uh, even a discussion with me, um, we can connect by email, uh, would help to clarify because certainly there's, there's some confusing elements to it. 
Um, and people do talk about normal high water versus bank pool width, and some of it is subtle, but most of it really just comes down to a lot of practice, getting out in the field and looking for the basic indicators that we talk about um, when we're trying to measure those uh, distances, those widths, and also doing many of them. And that's the key, is really taking a whole bunch of measurements and then averaging them, and you get a sense um, of how best to do it. I have a document somewhere that I'll try to dig up for when we're training our, we've done such a great job. I think Sarah and others mentioned how well we've done at surveying basic stream crossings in Maine, more than any other jurisdiction its size in the world. And in training those folks, we had some pretty basic elements to look for in measuring bank full width. And I could post that uh, on the Stream Smart website. That's great, Alex, thank you. Uh, we have we've had a couple of questions on how do we how do we convince towns to do this? How do we get more stream smart crossings on the landscape? And, and a couple of folks have said, I've got one near my house and how do I get my town to do something? Um, I'll, I'll start by saying um, get your folks from town to come to some of these trainings um, to understand some of the, the basics of what we're talking about in the big picture. Um, and also um, the financial resources that are available um, and uh, because that's often the biggest hurdle that folks have. And it, if you are a citizen of the town and you get other citizens of your town asking your town to do these things, hopefully the, um, the groundswell will, will bring you to the right place. I don't know if anyone else wants to jump on that. Yeah, yeah sure. Go right ahead. Oh, sorry, Alex, didn't mean to steal your thunder. Um, you know, talking with town managers and D DPW, um, meeting, meeting folks in the field. Um, Lucian and I um, will go out there and meet. We'll try to get someone from IFW uh, with a little bit of knowledge on the stream. We're always encouraging people to attend Stream Smart so that they understand this stuff. Um, big, a big deal is the, the DEP Stream Crossing Grant. I mean, now there's a funding mechanism um, the towns really, you really can't say we don't have the money um, if they don't even try for the grant. So really promoting, you know, the combination of Stream Smart and a funding mechanism um, and, and working that. A lot of word of mouth, um, you know, the chorus tried to, to do a lot of outreach, whether it's with the engineering firms across the state. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to get um, in front of the organization for DEP, DPW, excuse me, um, and just really promoting this stuff. And, and, and as was noted before, once you get an excavator and dump trucks on site, you know, the cost, the cost of the culvert at that point or the stream smart is really minor in the grand schema of all the costs. So just trying to provide a lot of the information that, that has been given here today to those people in the field face to face, despite COVID. And I'd love to speak to a very particular question that Michael McDonald asked really early on uh, that gets at this very point too. Uh, I have direct examples. I won't name the towns right now, but one that comes to mind was one of the first uh, recipients of a DEP upgrade grant that I worked really hard to get uh, for them. Uh, and it turned out in this particular town, one of the three selectmen was very interested and saw all the validity of this. Um, I'm not sure he may have been to a stream smart uh, workshop, in fact, but the road commissioner was quite uncomfortable. And he was in that uh, sort of realm of folks who I think was mentioned in another question who's really, they're used to doing small round culverts. They know how to do it. They, their equipment is suitable for it. They just have a backhoe and not a big excavator. So there are a lot of um, sort of reticence based on experience or lack of experience. And so I think this, these very workshops are really key in getting people the information from Stream Smart, from the website, and from anyone, like all these really helpful people like Colin, he just pointed out that we're very willing to talk to folks about the options uh, and the advantages of Stream Smart crossings. That's the way to make progress, I think. And so I'm, I'm very happy always to talk to road commissioners um, and other town officials to help them understand why we're doing this, why we think it is advantageous, uh, and not just from an ecological standpoint. And this is really about roads and infrastructure too and it's a great investment thanks folks um let's continue on the theme of costs and um get to one of the thornier topics which is private crossings um i talked about the nrcs program that is really um mostly used by um 
timber companies and farmers and um, not as much neighborhoods um, because that's not really the, the, the folks that NRCS targets uh, for service. And it has been trickier to get funding for private crossings, which from a biologist perspective, um, it's really hard to, to fathom because the fish don't care who owned that road or that crossing. And there are still public safety issues if someone needs to use that, that roadway. Um, in the past, I believe the DEP funding um, used to cover uh, road associations. They specifically took, the legislature took that out in the, the bond funding that came out a couple, a few years ago. Um, so we still struggle with this piece. And sometimes NRCS is able to, to do it in like a, um, camp situation where you have a bunch of camp roads, camp um, owners who all pay into one, um, but it is trickier. It is trickier with a group like that. It is something that we have been working on as an advocacy organization, going to the legislature, looking at bond funding and other funding sources. We're hoping that possibly with the climate action plan, um, you know, Stream Smart fits right into everything that that is being talked about in the climate action plan with climate change and these larger storms um, and the need to, to um, rebuild our infrastructure in the face of climate change. But we're not quite sure yet. Um, and if there are places that um, we can use advocacy, um, we may reach out to folks to ask for, for you to lend your voices um, as we push for some sort of funding program for that. Um, I don't know if other folks know of other programs other than small isolated local um, projects that, that have been funded. I'll just add, if the site happens to be a priority area from a state agency's fisheries perspective, whether we're talking DMR or IFNW, we sometimes have the ability to help sponsor or support a proposal to a variety of habitat restoration grant programs that there's a whole slew of them that potentially exist out there. Not all of them were listed on some of the slides and the presentations earlier today, but we know about those opportunities. And if it happens to be a priority area, even if it's a private crossing, such as a driveway or camp road, uh, we may often be able to help. There's still a time lag um, when you're talking about soliciting uh, external or grant funding, but just be aware of that. But there's also additional opportunities where private crossings are eligible. And if I could add um, also, yeah. it, I have a great goal and that is that maybe the, the we will be able to expand the state bond so the DEP is able to offer money uh, to private landowners because there's a real need. I see it everywhere. We see it in the questions today. Uh, it's, a, it's a real need, but I would also offer that I've seen so many situations as, as fearful as people are about the added cost that sometimes comes from StreamSmart that there are towns, there are private individuals doing crossings with help from some of us here and others uh, at a much more reasonable rate. You know, it, it's, it's really not about the stream smart elements. It's about what some of your, your standards are, um, who's doing the work. Sometimes it takes a little creativity, uh, but there are towns and individuals out there doing stuff at a really affordable uh, level um, to stream smart standards. And so I, I just don't wanna lose track of that. It is not all out of range for any normal road association uh, necessarily to do. Yeah, and one other thing I just wanna add about private crossings, especially if it's a smaller scale, low volume type road, is the engineering standards are not as stringent as like a busy road and a town road. So there are alternative technologies or designs that you can often get away with that are much cheaper in the big, in the grand scheme of things. Those are two excellent points. Um, cost and funding is always tricky and we're always working to try and get that to be less of a hurdle for folks. Um, there was a good question about um, not just thinking about one crossing at a time, but uh, how do we think about designing for a system when we have multiple crossings, maybe impoundments all associated within the same watershed. Um, how do we, where do we go for assistance on that sort of design and, and what sorts of things should we be thinking about that might be different from when we're just thinking one crossing at a time? I don't know if Mary or Alex wants to join in. I'll be happy to join in. I mean, certainly we we do a lot of this thinking uh, often it's really up to the the person 
people involved at the local level, whether it's town officials or um, these are private folks um, involved in a land trust, it, it, it can take so many different forms. But we, of course, we, most of us are looking at this from a systemic uh, standpoint. And so we love it when folks want to consider things at a broader scale. And then we can start to sort of slice and dice and think about um, what the priority should be in terms of which site first. Uh, when we're talking about sea run fish, um, if you own or control a crossing that is the lowest barrier in that stream network. It's, it is the barrier stopping sea run fish. We're often going to be saying, yes, let's get that one first, and then we can proceed in a stepwise manner, perhaps upstream, to help sea run fish. But on the opposite end of the spectrum, as for so many sites in Maine that have great brook trout, it's not may not be about getting sea run fish up, it's about expanding the network. And so the individual crossing that can get to the most good habitat to expand that inner stream network, that's where we're going to go first. But we're always going to be thinking in sequence about the other options involved. And so we're, I'm very happy, and I know probably Mary as other folks are very happy to talk to folk, people about that approach. Yeah, this is Colin. Uh, you know, Lucian, Lucian and I as regulators will be in the field and, uh, you know, we get the opposite of the system approach, which is, well, the downstream culvert's too small and the downstream culvert's hung, so why should we be doing anything at this culvert, anything special? And, um, you know, basically the, the company line is someone has to go first. That's great, Colin. Um, thanks. And I know that that next big RCPP that's being proposed by the Nature Conservancy and others is, I believe, part of the, the idea behind it is to think in watersheds or sub watersheds to really get connectivity um, that, that's meaningful um, at, at, at scale. Um, and I also wanted to throw in another plug for a resource that, that we haven't thrown in here yet, um, but you've seen a snapshot of it is the Stream Habitat Viewer. This is an online map resource. Um, there's a link to it from streamsmartmain.org, which you can also get through to through um, Maine Audubon's website. It has all the locations of all the public crossings, 90% of them or so, all across the state categorized as to whether they're barriers potential barriers are not barriers for, for fish passage. And there's a ton of information on other aquatic resources that are there that can help you bring the story to get financial aid or go to the resource agencies to, to get assistance um, on, on some of these and help you plan as a town or, or someone who's responsible for a, a, a sub watershed to really think about where to start. Oops. Yeah, Alex. Can I add to that, Sarah, a little bit? Just the mainstream habitat viewer is a great site. I don't say that just because I'm involved with it, but um, but it also sometimes misses. I just got a call from a road commissioner the other day saying, "Yo, we're not we're not in there. We don't. Well, the crossing may be in there, but we can't see the habitat." that we're talking about. And so I just, I wanna reiterate something that was said earlier. You really need to reach out to the regional biologists for inland fisheries and wildlife and or Maine Department of Marine Resources because they are, have just an immense wealth of knowledge personally, but also access to the databases of habitat and inf uh, fish information. So it may not appear on the map that there's habitat, but you can often find um, that information from those biologists, and that can then be used in grant applications, such as for DEP, um, just as validly as if it appears uh, on that map. Oh, I'll actually add there, if I can, um, with uh, multiple projects, it can, we haven't seen it a lot, but there have been some folks that have touted sort of relationships with other towns, because some of these you know, span across towns, if you can communicate with the towns or where, you know, look where that stream goes to, see if another municipality might be interested in putting in for a grant on theirs. And if there's a, a sort of synergy or some combined improvements that you can tout, that, you know, as a, as a little bit of a tip will help you out on the funding side, that it's, it's not just this one, that it's potentially the, a series or you're gonna get some other efficiencies out of it, even cost-wise um, from, you know, only mobilizing once or um, something like that. That's a great reminder, thanks, John. Um, we are getting close to our drop dead time. It, it is 11.53, so I don't know if, um, we don't have too many questions still in the box here. If folks wanna continue the discussion, um, Hannah can put a link into, um, oh, I guess Hannah just emailed it to folks. Can we put it in the, the chat? Yeah, all panelists have it in their emails and then I will place okay. it in the chat. 
Uh, just a reminder to the folks that as we transition from this Zoom to the next Zoom, it will be a few minutes. So just hang tight. In the other one. If you do not get, um, if you can't get the link, you can also send me an email and I'll put my email in the chat box as well. Excellent. Thank you, Hannah. Um, and again, I think we've, we've, uh, we just have a couple more questions in the box and maybe we can go through for a few more minutes before folks jump over. Um, and I don't know who wants to take this one, maybe Mary, I'll throw it at you, but maybe some of the regulators want to jump in. Uh, the question is, are there large industrial road slash dams being removed in the future to allow salmon to get reestablished? And I just wanted to throw that out there as a, as another piece to talk about, um, Culverts are a huge thing, but dams are a big, a big piece too. And, and kind of like the question about multiple culverts, dams and culverts together um, uh, cause, cause problems. I don't know if you want to jump in, Mary. Sure. Dams are a, a bit of a different issue than culverts because of their size and, and generally the functions and their, you know, the length of time that they've been on the landscape. It's a totally different process that we do have to go to, but go through um, there are dams and the various structures are regulated in different ways depending on the service that they're providing on the landscape. So there are different kind of processes and in many cases stakeholders or players involved with those discussions. Um, there is dam removal, dam breach are always possibilities. However, it's a totally different process with different potential outcomes and also the reasons for dams on the landscape vary dramatically and significantly um, across the state of Maine. So um, although we're always open to suggestion on dam removal, and I will say that there are a lot of legacy structures out of the landscape. In some cases, they're not even known about until you round a stream bend and there you see an old log driving dam or something. And sometimes they're fully intact and have been there for decades and we've all forgotten about it. Those structures tend to be a little easier to tackle and deal with versus the big dams like on the main stem rivers. Um, it's just a different kind of process and in, in, in a system that we have to work through. Thanks, Mary. Amy, or Wendy, did you want to jump in on that one or? Yeah, so dam removal and dam breaches or dam modifications and fish passage is, a, is an ongoing part of Atlantic salmon recovery efforts. So yeah, pretty much every year there's at least one or two dams coming out somewhere in Maine that's primarily related to um, restoration of Atlantic salmon. And for instance, this year, the Temple Stream Dam in the town of Farmington is coming out, which will be a huge boost to restoration of Atlantic salmon and other native fish in that section of the Sandy River. So yeah, there's, there's quite a concerted effort on dam removals, fish passage, dam modifications related to Atlantic salmon recovery in Maine. Great, thank you, Wendy. Um, and maybe we just have a couple minutes before we're all kicked off and can join, jump into the next meeting, um, but maybe I'll come back to you, Mary. There was a question earlier, are these stream smart projects being monitored to just to determine what's happening with fish and wildlife um, after, after they're put in? Some are. Um, the reality is, is uh, as fish biologists, as wildlife biologists, this is an action that we already know benefits the populations that we're trying to help. So um, looking at improving aquatic connectivity and riverine systems has been a hot topic in research for decades now in, the, in fisheries biology and science. Um, these are actions that we know enhance and facilitate populations. And as practitioners actively working at, dam at uh, culvert replacement sites, um, as soon as you pull those coffer dams and get your natural flow going back through a system, the fish are zipping right back in there and often continuing right on upstream. Um, we've seen this happen. Uh, but some high priority sites that are sometimes testing new technologies or new methods, we do have a minuscule monitoring program and I would say, at least from the perspective of inland fish and wildlife, um, uh, for sites that are being replaced in priority and known wild brook trout areas, after construction is completed, we usually do go back out to the site and just verify that the, the replacement happened to design specs and 
um, meeting standards and criteria and permitting requirements. So we do visually inspect almost all of our sites within Brook Trout Country. Thanks, Mary. Alex, do you want to jump on? Really quickly, I know we're about out of time, but yeah, yeah. Nature Conservancy has devoted quite a bit of energy uh, into surveying a number of sites, not for the fish counts necessarily, because that does get more complex and, and difficult, but but for the to make sure truly not just as built exactly, but to look over time and see how the tr stream has changed in relation to that stream smart crossing. And they're building up a, essentially a data set of a number of crossings looked at over the years, which is really useful. And I can't say it's a big surprise. It looks like everything is working beautifully. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. That is fantastic. And before we get kicked off this platform, and I'd love to see everybody in the, the other Zoom meeting, um, I want to thank you all for coming. We had over, we had nearly 160 folks here today doing, talking about Stream Smart. So that is records for sure. Um, and apologies for any of the quality challenges that we had. Um, and thank you to all the panelists who came because this was, I asked a lot of you and I said, hey, turn it all on its head, what you've done before. And you all did it. And I really, really appreciate it.